Today's session is Anatomy of a Real-Time Elixir App. I'm Steve. I'm actually not even going to go into present mode because uh, there's no point to it. So let's just, let's just do the slides like this. So Steve Bussey, I'm a software architect at SalesLoft in Atlanta. I uh, just hit my six-year anniversary with the company. Um, so it's been cool to see the company go from, you know, 10 employees when I started up to, you know, almost 500 now uh, and using Ruby and Elixir powering our backends. And through some acquisitions, we have some Node and some Go now too. But for me, it's primarily been Ruby and Elixir. Uh, I've been using Elixir in production for several years now, both at SalesLoft and then also on personal projects that I work on, um, you know, working on one right now using Elixir and Absinthe, which is pretty fun. And I love Elixir. I think that it has changed how I view programming. And one of the reasons I love teaching people about Elixir is I hope that they'll also see, you know, the beauty of it and feel empowered by it. As mentioned, I am the author of Real Time Phoenix, uh, which you can access via that URL, sal.es slash RTP. Um, I got the book here, came out in print a few months back uh, when all of the COVID started. Um, I don't, I don't have a discount code or anything today, but I would say that the best discount code you'll get is from the DevTalk forums. Um, so if you go on there, there's 35% off any of the eBooks, which is really good. So the goal for today's talk is to understand the importance of reading the source code of libraries that we use. And then we're gonna dive deep into how Phoenix channels work. Now we can't go into everything because we would need like two hours to do that. Um, so we're going to go really into the basics of how it works and look at a few key flows. So let's talk about real-time Elixir apps and what I mean by that. So a real-time app, you know, I, I'm talking about a web app here. I'm not talking about like hardware real-time. So this would be considered a soft real-time application. Um, and basically the way I sort of define that is that we're going to interact with clients. So, you know, web client, mobile client, whatever it might be. We want to keep those clients up to date as data changes. We might have goals set around how long it takes for data changes to propagate from the source to the client. So, you know, if there's a new piece of data, we don't want that coming in five minutes in the future. We want it coming in like in two seconds and we want it to feel really snappy for the user. And the way I think about a real time app is that the user should always see the truth. So if I know that something happened, I know this piece of data changed, my screen should say that I shouldn't, you know, know that this changed, I see something different on the screen, and now I have to reconcile that and maybe refresh the page or, or I'm frustrated with the experience. And there's a few different components of a real-time app, at least for the purpose of this talk. We have the client, which could be JavaScript, iPhone, etc. We have a, the server to client connection. So an example of that is WebSocket, although there's other technologies that can power that as well, especially as you get into different mediums, such as like the hardware space, um, or you know, uh, those types of different applications. Then we have the server, and obviously for this talk, we're gonna be looking at Elixir, and that's where you know, the Phoenix um, library and uh, framework really comes in. And then also, you know, there's this important concept of a data pipeline, which might be powered by something like GenStage, or maybe it's like homemade for, for the purposes of an application, but really that's how data moves from source to destination. So let's talk about anatomy. You know, why, why anatomy of a real-time Elixir app? So anatomy, at least in the non-biological sense, is a study of the structure or internal workings of something. What we're concerned about when we talk about anatomy is the relationship between small parts that complete that whole. So when we talk about anatomy of a software library, we can get a clear picture of the whole by understanding the parts. So that also means that we can more easily dig in and debug, and debug problems that pop up. And by doing so, we're going to gain self-sufficiency in our usage of a library. So what do I mean by self-sufficiency? Um, self-sufficiency takes us to the next level as developers because self-sufficient developers can answer questions that may not be immediately clear. Maybe the documentation was missing something um, or there was, you know, um, different concerns with how something may work. A self-sufficient developer can dig in and figure that out. Uh, Self-sufficient developers can more easily contribute to open source or their own internal code bases because they can uh, discover how things work and see, you know, how their change fits into that without being guided by other people. And then self-sufficient developers can get to the uh, bottom of problems that, uh, that arise to find a path forward. Uh, so they are looking for the solution rather than looking for someone that can provide them the solution. So 
when I, you know, talk about self-sufficiency, we have a path to get there. So in the context of, you know, you know, libraries, what we need to do is we need to approach a library with curiosity. So we need to put any types of um, uh, preconceptions that we have about the library out the window and, and approach it with a, a vein of curiosity. We need to dig in when a problem occurs. So if we encounter something that we didn't expect to work, you know, we might think it's a bug or we don't understand it. We need, that's, that's a great time to dig in rather than backing off. And then we can contribute back any learnings that we find. So maybe we find that there's a documentation error or something's missing, um, or we found a defect and we can report that back or even provide a patch to fix it. So um, today's talk is gonna be a lot of diving into code. I am glad that it was listed as advanced on the slides because it got a little bit more advanced than I thought it might, um, but we're, we're gonna try to go for it. So, um, as we go through this today, some techniques to, to think about are always starting with what you know. So there's a public interface to pretty much everything that we do. If we think about Phoenix channels and real-time apps, you know, we have a client. We as users can look at the client and see what it's doing. So that's sort of our, our public interface of what we know. And we can uh, work across a layer before going deeper. So let's say that I have a problem in my application it's probably gonna be a good idea for me to focus on my applications code and going into how that's working before I dive into Phoenix's internals to figure out what's going on there. Because most likely the issue is gonna be, you know, at not at the library level, but at the application level. Um, I tend to, you know, try to stay in order as I'm going through codes. So I don't like to jump around a lot. The way I think about it is that the, the computer is gonna be executing this code in a certain order. As, as someone that's trying to dive into that code, you should follow that same order so you can see how things are going. And then also taking notes because it can really get overwhelming. As I was writing Real-Time Phoenix, I was doing a lot of reading of the source code to make sure that I never wrote anything that was incorrect. And notes are so important there because there can be so much going on as you try to dive into some code that you're not familiar with. So now let's, let's actually dive into Phoenix channels and see you know, how, they're constructed and what the libraries are for that. So the first application that I'm sort of like basing this talk on is just like the 101 version of Phoenix channels. There's a very basic socket, no authentication, nothing like that, just a, a socket um, as plain as it can be. There's a channel that handles a message. So it's gonna be able to get a message from the client and then respond to it. There's gonna be a JavaScript client that connects to the socket and joins the channel. So let's go ahead and view that code really quick just to see what I'm talking about. So um, let's start with the client side of things and just see you know, how little code is necessary to actually um, use Phoenix Channel. So you know, we come in here and we define a socket. So we might have a question of what is a socket? Um, we, it doesn't really matter yet. The fact is that this is sort of like what the documentation says to do of how to use it. Uh, we need to connect the socket before we can actually, you know, send messages over it. So then we might have questions of how does it connect? So we need to uh, join and create a channel instance on that socket. So then I might have a question of how does a channel map to a socket? This is sort of that curiosity mindset. Rather than just typing the code, I'm thinking about what's happening under the hood. Then we have, then we join the channel. So I might have a question of what does that mean? How does the channel become joined? I can push some data up to the channel and then receive a reply back from that channel. So how does it receive and actually send that response back? And then I can receive unsolicited messages that come from the application server itself um, outside of that request response. Like I can just receive messages. So I might have a question of how does data go from the server to the client? And if anyone, uh, if anyone has done Phoenix channels before, they'll probably know that there's actually not that much code that goes into it. Our user socket is about as simple as it can be. We have no authentication or anything like that. It's just a very simple socket. And we have this one single channel that has no type of authorization or anything like that. It's just saying anyone can join and um, we're gonna have this function that handles the test message and replies with a response. So we can see that as we reload this page, we get a hello ElixirConf EU, which we can see came from that server. So this is sort of, this obviously not a, a, a real-time app, it's just more of a proof of concept, but this is what we're gonna dig in today of how things actually work. So you may have noticed there's not that much code in this whole thing. There's you know 12 lines here, 12 lines here, and 20 lines here. So not that much code, but 
you know, under the hood, there's sort of a lot of moving parts going on. What's a socket? How does it connect? How does a channel differ from a socket? How does a channel become joined? And how does a message get processed and responded to? So as engineers, we can sort of just say, well, those things don't matter because it all works. I mean, clearly it works because we got a response. But if we're trying to learn this library and understand how it works, now's the time to dig in. So let's do that. So there, I'm going to set a few ground rules for today's talk of how we're going to dig into this code. We're only going to go deeper into the code if we have a clear reason to. So obviously, I understand how this code is put together, but you may not. And at one point, I also didn't understand how this code was put together. So everything that we're going to dive into, we're going to have a clear path of why we're diving into it. So I'm going to, as part of that, assume no prior knowledge. We have to see something ourselves to um, apply it to our learnings. And I might jump around a little bit because of time to just like, you know, recap some things, but uh, that's going to be a rule which I stick to. And then we may end up with more questions and answers. You know, we're going we're gonna to see things and, and be able to answer these questions, but we're easily going to have four more questions that appear. So that's just, um, you know, the, the reality of digging into a library. So in order to get this all started, you know, we have to sort of start with what we know. And what we know is that we have a client and that client's connecting to a server. So we're going to look at the socket connection and how it's actually routed on the back end. And uh, if you haven't ever seen it, uh, it's actually really cool. In the network tab of Chrome, Firefox, basically everything, you can actually see WebSocket requests and you can actually see things like, you know, what was the initial connection to set up a WebSocket? What were the messages passed back and forth over that WebSocket? So when our WebSocket connected, or actually we didn't even know it's a WebSocket necessarily, we know that we initiated this socket and we put all this code in place and now there's a WebSocket. So, you know, I see that there's a request URL and I immediately think to myself, well, where does this actually go? I see slash socket slash WebSocket, but what actually powers that? So um, in our code base, we could grep for slash socket, but you know, this is something that I assume people would know because this is actually code in your application. Um, there is actually the definition of slash socket in our endpoint file. And we can see it here, it's a socket. Um, we define our handler, which is called user socket. In this case, we're actually defining that it is a WebSocket and we're passing in long pole false. So what's a WebSocket, what's long pole? We'll see those things next. So my initial question then is, all right, what is actually the socket function? What is socket doing? So in order to do that, uh, we could look at phoenix.endpoint, the socket macro, which is the actual function, the macro that's being invoked uh, when this is um, typed. So this socket uh, macro is actually very simple. All it's basically doing is um, taking in those uh, parameters that we give it and putting it into this at Phoenix socket uh, module attribute. So, you know, what is Phoenix socket module attribute how it, and how is it used? Also, uh, this is a good time to point out that reading library source code can give you really interesting tidbits of things that you didn't know. This comment, multiple lines of comment for one little line of code, it's very interesting because it talks about how um, Phoenix makes it so that the, uh, a little bit of compile time efficiency so that there's not um, a dependency between the, the endpoint and the socket. And so that's just a really interesting thing that we wouldn't have known about if we didn't read the source code. So that takes us into our, how is, so how is Phoenix sockets being used? So in order to get here, what we could do is like grep for the code base and look for Phoenix sockets and what's actually um, being used. And it's used in this before compile function. And I posted the slides in the, uh, uh, in the uh, Q and A session, but all of these links are clickable and will take you to the exact line of code that I'm referencing. So you can see the surrounding code and uh, follow along for yourself. So every code snippet is annotated that way. And so what we can see is that um, that socket is essentially turned into a thing called a dispatch. We don't really know what that is yet, but we can see that the sockets are looped over and they're turned into this do handler function uh, with a few different uh, like meta programming things um, uh, powering that. So we can dig in a little bit more and say, right, how, is do how are these dispatches being used? And uh, in the same file, we can see, oh yeah, that's how dispatches is used. It's actually a bunch of functions that are unquoted and actually put into this module, which I think is a pretty cool metaprogramming technique. Um, so these are, again, you, you can learn a lot of things by, by reading source code. Uh, 
So when the endpoint is invoked, these function, these do handlers are going to be uh, invoked based on the the matches and and you know how um, and how the functions are defined. So normally, if you you know the basic one is that it just calls it as a plug. But in this case, these dispatches are not going to go through plug. They're going to go through their own functions. And just look real quick. Uh, if we go back here, we can see that this is calling socket paths and is sort of constructing this, uh, this uh, tuple based on that. So we can go into socket paths next and see, all right, well, here's, a, here's the, our web socket. So we can see web socket versus long pole. And we see that there's this idea of a transport. So we have a transport web socket, transport long pole, and essentially, you know, this uh, structure of some sort is constructed based on the input parameters and based on, uh, you know, what, the, what these functions are doing. And um, it's, I would admit that it's sort of hard to read this code and see what's going on under the hood. So one technique that you can do is actually modify your dependency source code to learn things like this. So what I did in this case was actually go into my application. You can see it here on the left side. I pull up the Phoenix library in my depths folder and I can actually go to the endpoint and look for the dispatches and just slap an IO inspect in there. So I can actually, instead of trying to figure out what the code is doing, I can just throw in an IO inspect and actually just see the output of it which really helps clarify things. And this is what that sort of looks like. We can see that it's uh, this def p, it's gonna define a function called do handler. And we can read all this, but it's actually not that important. But the important thing is there's no function calls here. Do handler is not invoking some, some other function. All it's doing is returning um, this array or the, 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 this list format of this response. We see WebSocket. We see uh, our user socket comes in here. Um, so, you know, what, what's going on here? What the heck? So before we dig into that, let's sort of regroup at where we're at so far. So we've seen some neat metaprogramming techniques. Um, so reading the source code has already taught us something that we didn't know before. Um, we can see that Phoenix maps each of those defined sockets into a set of dispatch functions. We can see that Phoenix supports web sockets and long poles, but we're seemingly stuck because we have no function calls to go off of, we just have this format. Well, grep is our best friend in this case. So we notice that this um, uh, function uh, is calling, or, or one of these, I forget at what point, is calling underscore underscore handler, uh, which is a very, very specific um, function. And so we can grep for that in our depths folder. And you can sort of see the result of that here. It's literally used in the Phoenix endpoint and the Cowboy 2 handler. So this sort of gives us our next, we've already been in the endpoint. We've already seen this type of thing. So now we need to go into the Cowboy 2 handler and see what this actually is. So as we look at the handler, as we look at Cowboy 2 uh, handler in it, this is where we come into the WebSocket. Oh, hey, uh, this is what we saw over here. We saw uh, uh, this structure of WebSocket. Um, so that's sort of interesting. We can see that um, when it is a WebSocket, it's going to invoke this transport WebSocket connect function. So we're sort of back to this transports.webSocket that we initially saw constructing the AST. Now we see this connect function being called. So we're, we're starting to get somewhere. And we can also see that at the end of this case statement, we finally get down to cowboy WebSocket. So all of this is going to be doing some stuff just to produce this tuple at the end. So we're gonna um, come back to that in a second. We sort of have this fork in the road. We have two paths to take. What is transport WebSocket and what is Cowboy WebSocket? So transport WebSocket is a module that um, we can see here, it's basically a connect function and then this configuration function. So it's uh, you know not too much going on. We have this long connect function that looks a, you know, sort of a bit like what you know, a plug might be or a Phoenix. It's taking a con and it's invoking a bunch of functions on that. Um, so there's an interesting thing here. Number one is it's it's not a plug. This is this is um, these are a bunch of functions. They're not actually plugs. So that's just an interesting thing, even though it is operating on a con. Um, and then also down here, we see um, this handler.connect. Well, we know from our uh, our socket that there's a connect function. So that's just an interesting thing. So you know, maybe that's our socket, but our socket is connect slash three. There's three parameters, but this is connect one. 
So that's a little bit un unusual. So that's sort of, you know, where we need to dive into next. What is Connect One? Um, the other fork in the road, so we're looking at what Cowboy WebSocket is. So what we can do in this case is Google, or we could grep. Um, so if I Google Cowboy WebSocket, sure enough, I find uh, this module um, or this library that powers WebSockets as a ranch protocol. And if we, I'm not gonna dig into this for, further today, but this is actually how Phoenix powers its WebSocket implementation. And we, we see here that when in it is called, it has to return this particular format, Cowboy WebSocket, and then these um, parameters. And that's exactly what happens right here. So we sort of see this link between the two now. So coming together again, we see that Phoenix uses Cowboy WebSocket to power its WebSocket implementation. We see that uh, Transport WebSocket uh, doesn't go through the application router or plug, it's just a functional pipeline. We see that our appsocket.connect slash one function is called by Transport's WebSocket. But we don't know yet what is connect slash one because what we have is connect slash three. So if we start digging into that, we look at connect one. Um, that is actually defined in Phoenix socket. So it makes sense. We're looking at sockets and, and here's connect one. And basically we're going through a few different layers. So connect calls underscore, underscore, connect, underscore, underscore, which is a function that defines, um, you know, a, a lot of different sort of handlers, but the one that we particularly care about is uh, this user connect function. And then we finally get down to user connect and we see um, handler.connect slash three. So now we're actually finally getting into our application code and handler connect three um, will be the function whoops, that our application uh, has defined, which in this case is this function. And when it returns okay and a socket, uh, it returns back and sort of bubbles back up to Cowboy that the connection has been allowed. So that sort of answers our question around what is a, a socket? Uh, in this case, what is Phoenix socket and how does our application connect to it? So that takes us to our, the next question, which is how does a channel join? And at this point, we sort of have to go back to the front end and um, you know, start our investigation over there. So in the network inspector for WebSockets, you can view all of the data that's being sent up and down over that WebSocket. And if we inspect our, um, our user socket, what we'll see is this, um, this message that's being uploaded to the server called Phoenix join, and then we see a Phoenix reply. So this message format looks a little bit foreign, but we'll come back to that. Um, but now I have something to go off of, which is Phoenix join. Um, and the other thing I know is that WebSocket, this is being sent up and then being passed down. And if I go back to Cowboy WebSocket, I'll see that, that there's a certain particular format of a function that Cowboy WebSockets expects to be defined, which is called a WebSocket handle. So again, if I go back to my handy dandy friend grep, I can find a WebSocket handle in the code base referenced again by the module we've already seen, Cowboy2 Handler. And here we go, we have a, a function called handler.handle in, and sure enough, um, this is our demo socket, and this is actually how the message, um, any message that's being received by that web socket is going to invoke handle in on the demo socket. So um, this tells us that our demo socket is almost like a, a proxy. Um, it's not actually, the cowboy handler itself. The cowboy handler is this module, cowboy2 handler, but everything is proxied through that and then proxied down to our demo socket. And if we start digging into that code base, we'll see that handle in slash two defines this uh, proxy function to underscore underscore in underscore underscore. And uh, we can go into that function and see uh, these two lines of code. And these are two very important lines of code because we see map.get state.channels topic and we see this uh, um, decode bit but this is really the the important bit i want to get out here one of the questions i hear uh, so much when people are learning channels for the first time is what's the what's a channel what's a topic and what's a socket and this really clearly shows that all that a topic is is a is a key in a map and so that's just a really interesting thing a topic is a key in a map it's not a process it's not a, it's not a function it's a key in a map in this case, it's a string key. So, uh, and we'll come back to this a little bit in a second. 
So if we go into handle in, there's a bunch of different ways that handle in is defined. Um, as you click in this source code, you'll see, I think there's like 11 definitions of this based on pattern matching. But the one that we care about is referencing Phoenix join. And we can see that there's this Phoenix channel server join function being invoked. And then, which we'll come to in a minute. But then we also see that um, if everything was successful, we're gonna put a PID into the state. So, you know, what's that about? Let's, let's look at put channel real quick. This sort of solidifies the concept of what a topic and what a channel is. So the channel is a map in the state of a topic um, to a PID and a monitor reference. So in this case, we can sort of say that a channel is a PID, a channel is a process, a topic is the string. So regroup real quick. So we know that cowboy, the cowboy handler is gonna route all incoming messages through our socket. Each socket is a new process. Um, which is the uh, done by cowboy. Uh, the top level functions are all handled by use phoenix.socket, not by our module itself. We know that channels are just an entry in a map and that we, we know that each channel must be a process because it can be monitored and it's called PID in the code. So this takes us back to our question of, um, you know, these four questions we started with. We already know what a socket is, we know how it connects. Um, we sort of know how a channel differs from a socket, but we don't, um, we don't know too much about that yet. We, uh, we can see how a channel becomes joined with the Phoenix join, um, and we're gonna go into how messages can be processed and responded to. So let's look at channel startup real quick. So uh, this is, and this is a really important bit of what channels actually are, is, is how they're started. So there's a lot of code here of when the channel, this is channel server join that we saw referenced um, a few slides back. Um, and basically, we, uh, the, the really important part of this is line 27, which is that a, a pool supervisor is starting a new process. And then that process is being sent a payload. So all that we have here is a gen server and a message. So we can understand that. And all this other stuff is sort of um, state setup and monitoring setup. But the really key bit is line 27. And we can see, uh, since it's a process that's receiving a message, we can go to handle info and see that handler. And again, we have a lot of setup, but the really important bit is line 299, which calls channel join. And as we dig into that, uh, we can see that channel join calls init join. And then finally init join uh, actually um, sort of starts uh, this channel uh, and uh, gets everything set up for it. So in this case, um, one of the questions that was asked is what is PubSub and how does it relate to channels? And line 420 here is the, you know, a great answer to that. Channels, the channel process subscribes to PubSub on the topic that the channel is for. So that's sort of the relationship between PubSub and channels. So if a, if a message is sent over this PubSub to this topic, the channel process is going to retrieve it or receive it. If the PubSub has sent a message on a different topic, that channel is not going to receive it unless we call PubSub subscribe on the, the topic that we care about. And uh, finally, if we go back into, uh, actually um, look at one thing real quick. Um, oh, here we go, yeah, line 377 is what I was looking for. This is our channel join slash three, which is invoked right here, channel join slash three. So that's gonna be expected to return okay socket, which calls init join. And while we're here in this handle info section of channel server, um, it is important to note that the final handle info is basically this sort of catch all for all types of messages is going to check if handle info uh, is defined in our channel module and then it's going to send the uh, send the message to it, uh, or sort of, I shouldn't say send the message, it's to say call a function called handle info, and then it's going to handle the result of that. So we can know that we know that our channel is a process, but it's also a proxy. Uh, it's actually the, the process is channel server. Our channel is just invoked at key points, um, such as socket.channel.handle info right here. So a uh, the the gen server for channel is backed by phoenix channel server it can handle any unhandled messages via handle info and it lives under the phoenix socket mapped by a topic so that takes us to our final point uh, which is the incoming message and reply and let me uh let me try to go real quickly through this 
we saw handle in um, Phoenix socket defines a handle in that literally sends the um, process or sends in this case the channel process the message. That channel uh, is going to receive a uh, it has the handle info for a very particular type of format, which is the the message payload and is going to invoke handle in at that point in time. So we can see it on line 316. And when handle in is invoked, that is going to uh, basically um, call our, uh, our handler to get a result. And then that result is gonna be processed here. So if we told it to reply, it's gonna invoke that handle reply function, which um, basically comes down into this reply function, which just sends a PID a message. So in this case, the PID is the Cowboy WebSocket handler process. And the message is a uh, particular format defined by a serializer, um, which we, we get into from way back uh, earlier, we saw this um, V2 JSON serializer. And we can see that uh, the serializer in this case, uh, V2 JSON serializer defines in code and basically has this array format because uh, it is JSON and then is going to be um, turned into da data that's pushed over the Cowboy WebSocket handler down to the client. So sorry, Steve, each... we have just two more minutes. Cool, and I'm almost session. wrapped up here. So let me, oh, okay. uh, Thanks. Let, yeah, and, and I'll handle any questions over the chat too. I was sort of um, planning on doing that. Um, cool, thanks. So um, let's regroup real quick. So we know that each message is handled by the channel server as a, as a, uh, as a message, as a gen server message which means that each message is processed serially, one at a time, which means that you could bottleneck your channel. So that's sort of why channels can be bottlenecked and that's something to consider. We know that the socket transport has sent that serialized reply. And we know that all messages over the wire up and down are serialized into that format. So that sort of gives us rough answers to all of our questions. And we're not gonna go into live view today, but I'll just give a quick thing on that, which is that LiveView is gonna feel more familiar than it feels unknown because LiveView leverages everything that we just saw around how Phoenix Socket works in its special module called Phoenix LiveView Socket, which you can look up the code for. And then Phoenix LiveView Channel follows all those channel behaviors that we saw and is a process and, and behaves very much like a channel does, but is also different. So, you know, the sort of takeaway of today is that the Phoenix real-time stack is incredibly powerful. You can write not a lot of code, but get rich real-time features. Uh, if you read through the source code, if you hit snag or are curious, then you're gonna unblock yourself or learn something new, but you're definitely gonna be, uh, become more self-sufficient and be more uh, fluent with the library. So I wanna thank everyone uh, for the time today. Sorry for pushing right up to time, but I will answer any questions over the, uh, over the uh, Whova app. Um, you can uh, get real-time Phoenix at the uh, sal.es slash RTP. That's uh, on Pragmatic Programmers. You can hit me up on Twitter or email. And I put the slides uh, with all of this stuff in the uh, Whova app so you can get, uh, get that as well.